welcome to Great Railways. We're going to show you a historic film of 4472, the Flying Scotsman, making a non-stop run from London to Edinburgh in 1968, which was the 40th anniversary of the first time the non-stop run had been made over that route. And also, we're going to show you a film the Romance of the Indian Railways, which is uh, a great romance indeed. At that time, 12 years ago, when the Flying Scotsman film was made, it was thought that steam was on the way out. The locomotives, in a very short time, 13 years, 18,000 locomotives had been withdrawn from traffic, and they were languishing in the scrapyards. Some of them were preserved, some of them went to museums, but it was, it was generally thought to be the end. But now everything is different. Even the most die-hard modernists realize that there's money in steam trains and a great amount of preservation work is taking place. But then in addition to that, you've got this marvelous miniature railway run by John Southern down here near Liscard, Cornwall, England. This is a, um, a miniature of a, a part of the Union Pacific Railroad and John Southern here carries passengers in their tens of thousands up a replica of the great Sherman Hill in Wyoming where the gradient is 1 in 65. Now he is built also a line where the gradient is exactly the same. And to do that work, he's got to have pretty powerful locomotives. And John Southern hasn't done things by halves. He's got a model here of the largest steam locomotive that was ever built anywhere in the world. The Union Pacific Big Boy. It's a colossal thing with a wheel arrangement of 4884. The front driving unit is articulated to get round tight curves with the steam pipes flexible. There's an enormous boiler with a twin artifice blast pipe, three safety valves each side. The original engines had a working pressure of 300 pounds per square inch. This one works at 100. These monsters needed so much coal that one man couldn't fire them, and they had mechanical stokers. They worked very heavy trains up Sherman Hill and brought the loaded eastbound fruit trains from California. The original locomotive has a weight of 535 tons. This one weighs two tons. It's interesting that although uh, there were 25 of these in America originally, and three of them have been preserved, this is the only one in the world that is still a working big boy. Now let's see our steam.
And now we must leave the Forest Railroad Park and turn to 4472. Not this beautiful little model, which is in front of me now, the first 00 gauge model of the Flying Scotsman, but the real thing. In 1968, Alan Pegler organized a non-stop run from King's Cross to Edinburgh by the Flying Scotsman in celebration of the 40th anniversary that that run was made. It was also very important to make it at that time because the water troughs would have been taken up. In the train, notice two celebrated authors in conversation with each other, the Reverend Audrey of Thomas the Tank Engine fame and C. Hamilton Ellis. And also, uh, you will note that in two places, the exhaust beat of the engine, as rendered by the soundtrack, doesn't agree with the speed of revolution of the wheels. The age of steam has finally gone. All that remains now is the memory and the metal carcasses and the long wait for the breaker's torch. The steam engine is one of the most potent symbols of an era of both ruthless prosperity and bitter struggle, of a time when each machine had an individuality that a man could respect and come to terms with in a way that no longer exists. In 1923, Sir Nigel Gresley's new A3-class Pacific locomotive, Flying Scotsman, was a part of this tradition. Five years later, on the 1st of May 1928, it pulled out of King's Cross Station on the first non-stop run from London to Edinburgh. In 1934, it was the first steam locomotive to reach 100 miles an hour, and by then, the name Flying Scotsman had acquired a special glamour it has never really lost. After two million miles of service, Flying Scotsman made its last run for British Rail in 1963. It was bought the same year by businessman Alan Pegler. He restored it to its former LNER glory and has run it ever since on steam excursions for railway clubs and societies. Of course, when one buys a piece of machinery like the Flying Scotsman and intends running it, especially non-stop to Scotland, one has to have somewhere to keep and maintain it. At the time, one had to look around with an eye to the future, and one found that Doncaster was one of the few locomotive depots left that could cope with this kind of work. It was near the family business, and of course the Flying Scotsman itself was built here, so back here she came. One simply pays the rent and all the bills, and British Railways do the rest. I'm lucky enough to have the services of a number of retired railwomen who keep her looking the way she should look. And I'm pretty certain the reason they do this is not because of the present day glamour attached to the Flying Scotsman, but the fact that they're able to recapture a way of life that they possibly grumbled about as young men, but which nevertheless became a part of living that they felt they had lost forever. You came to work. Uh, you had a snap tin, you were packed up. You didn't know how long that snap was going to last you. I mean, you might be away as long as 16 hours on occasions. Many a time come home to a, a dried up dinner or a, a wife in a bad temper. I've seen my children at home, they said, hello, dad, are you going to work? No, I'm not. Oh, you'll be going to bed then. And that's the kind of thing he used to get. It was either all work and no pleasure or all work or all bed. That's, that's how it used to be. There's none of that nowadays, I don't suppose.
rather a strange feeling now after well, I was working it out, it's about three and a half years really that this exercise first was mooted and now that it's finally come to the morning it's rather like um, I suppose a diver on the high board waiting to take the plunge and uh, I really can't wait now to and get on the foot plate and get on with it. How much do you think we've got on there now? By the nine tons, fifteen. Uh, nine and a half. Nine fifteen. That will be well away. Well away. Yeah. Yeah. Should be at ample, all the way through. Yeah. Yes. Good. Well, we've got to do the remaining topping up before we move off. Coming up light, she's burnt a lot, hasn't she? She's burnt a lot, hasn't she? Right. Extra coal up here, it's all going to get In the old days, of course, when there were plenty of steam locomotives running everywhere, uh, there was no problem, the water was treated in advance. Now, you never know what sort of water you're going to get, so we treat our own in this way. These briquettes will fill in here, and gradually during the journey, these get dissolved into the water, and it ensures that you get uh, nice clean water in the boiler, and uh, it makes the boiler last a great deal longer, at least that's the theory anyway. The object, as far as I was concerned, was to be allowed to have a go, and it is an extraordinary thought, I, in my opinion anyway, that on a great nationalised undertaking, one can take out a private piece of machinery, 45 years old, and uh, hitch it onto a train of British Railways stock and take 300 people 400 miles on, the, on a weekday in the middle of all the other services. Uh, let's face it, I mean, this is a pretty sporting gesture on the part of the British Railways board, in my opinion. Anyway. Well, I'm not able to go on the run today, but I just wanted to come and see my dear old Edgar again to say how do and wish her good luck. Right away.
I met my wife for the very first time on this uh, Flying Scotsman train on the 1st of May 1928. And therefore, this journey is giving me the most tremendous thrill. But my wife didn't even know it was a non-stop, and certainly not the first non-stop run. And she was ensconced in another carriage, but an elderly, a more elderly lady who was supposed to be keeping an eye on her had booked her a seat in our compartment. Much to her disgust, she took her away from a very pleasant, youthful surroundings and brought her into our carriage where she was horrified to find we'd got a parson. And I was really rather coarse about this, and I said in French to Mademoiselle Le Coeur, it's very sad to bring me in here when I was having such a lovely time in the other end, you know, and, um, my, and, and making me sit next to a parson and making me behave myself for the rest of the journey. And um, he, he just turned round and answered in perfect French. And I was really completely shattered about this. However, he was extremely nice. And um, he, um, he gave us a wedding present, I remember. So he, he wasn't too cross with me in the end. There were only the four of us there. And everybody was fearfully matey and excited about this. And we were being greeted on the way by waving crowds with flags and banners and all the town bands were turning out. Everybody on the train got most tremendously friendly. A terrific excitement, a sense of occasion. And uh, so naturally, when the time came for lunch, I suggested to my new friend, Molly Payne as she was then, uh, what about coming to have a spot of lunch with me? And she was very young in those days and very shy, as indeed she still is, and uh, would not have accept my invitation to go and have lunch with her in the dining car. However, the parson made it all right and he said, well, perhaps you may allow me to invite you both, and then that will be all very seemly and proper. In those days, one bothered about such things. And we went to lunch, and during the rest of the journey, we got on like a house on fire, and we were engaged within three weeks' time. And so I was let in for 40 years' hard labor. Well, I think that it was 40 years' hard for me, not for you, anyway. <laughs>